Welcome students once again to Chem Estry. In this video today, we are talking about electrolysis. We've already considered the galvanic or voltaic cell. And we've seen that over there, a species or a substance chooses to give electrons to another substance. And as the electrons move, electricity is generated. Today, in electrolysis, we are going to see something different. In electrolysis, a chemical reaction occurs by the loss or the gain of electrons when electric current is passed through a substance. In this situation, the substance doesn't want to give off the electrons. So we use electric current or electricity to force that substance to lose electrons. The kind of electricity used over here is direct current. We don't use AC. It is really DC. Because when we use AC, the poles will keep on switching. Positive and the negative poles will keep on switching. And it is going to disturb our work we are going to do. You will have a look at that one in the successive videos and how AC is going to really affect it. Because over there we'll be talking about the, the, the negative and the positive poles. But today, we need to know that for the decomposition of the substance to occur, we have to pass DC through it. If you use AC, decomposition would not occur because the poles will keep on switching. The positive will become negative, the negative will become positive, and after changing, it will still change again, and it will change again, and it will change again, and that is going to disturb our experiment. This electrolysis occurs in a device which we call a voltameter. We can think about the difference between the galvanic cell and the electrolytic cell like this. There is this kit. This kit is called Junior. And this is me. I am bigger than Junior. Now, whenever I meet Junior, I give Junior biscuits. I do so willingly. I'm not forced to do that. That is a classical example of a galvanic or voltaic cell. Something happened one day. I gave Junior biscuits. Then I told Junior, Junior, I'm hungry. Please give me some of the biscuits to eat. I gave the biscuit to Junior. But Junior should give me some of the biscuits. Junior is saying, no. I begged and begged Junior. Yet Junior didn't want to give me the biscuits. So Junior's mother came in and took the biscuit from Junior and gave it to me that, sir, take the biscuit and eat. Now, this is a classical example of an electrolytic cell. Junior is supposed to give me electron or biscuit, and he is feeling reluctant to give it to me. So what happens? The mother, direct current, comes to force Junior to give me the biscuit. Now, that is what really happens in electrolysis. Now, there are some technologies we need to become acquainted with when it comes to electrolysis. Let's have a look at them. And the first one we are going to talk about is electrolytes. An electrolyte is just a compound which conducts electricity in the molten state or when it is dissolved in water. So you put the substance in water and it's able to conduct electricity. Or when you melt the substance, the substance can conduct electricity. But how is that going to happen? That substance should contain ions. So that when you melt it, the ions become free to move about. And when the ions are free to move about, they will be carrying electric charges from one place to another. Also, when that substance is placed in water, it breaks into its individual ions. Then the ions become free to move about in the solution. So whenever ions are free to move about in solution, 
that substance is able to conduct electricity. And any substance that is ionic, which will break down into its ions when it is placed in water, or when we melt it, is what we call an electrolyte. There are two types of electrolytes. We have strong electrolytes and we have weak electrolytes. Now, what's the difference between a strong electrolyte and a weak electrolyte? Well, let's have a look at this diagram. In the diagrams below, we have two beakers. Each one contains some dots. Let's try to understand the dots. We have black dots and red dots. The black dots represent hydrogen ions. The red dots represent chloride ions in the first diagram. And when we add the black and the red dot together, we have HCl, hydrochloric acid. In the second diagram, the black dot represents hydrogen ions. The red dot represents fluoride ions. Then the black with the red dot combined represents hydrofluoric acid. This is going to represent a strong electrolyte and that one is going to represent a weak electrolyte. The difference is that you realize when you place HCl in solution or in water, all the black and the red dots are completely broken. They become free to move about. HCl in the aqueous state is said to be ionic. So when we break the ion into hydrogen ion and the chloride ions, we say we have deionized it. So we have stopped it from being an ion to become separate entities. So we call that one deionized. Another word for deionized is dissociate. In the second diagram, you would realize that some of the black dots are free. We have one, two of them. And two red dots, they are all free to move about. But if you look at the diagram carefully, you realize that these red and black dots have been combined. They are not breaking apart. So what we can say is that HCl has undergone what we call a complete deionization or complete dissociating. Complete dissociation. Such that all the ions have broken apart and they are now free to move about. In the HF, it has undergone what we call partial ionization or incomplete ionization, also known as partial or incomplete dissociation. Now, this is what distinguishes a strong electrolyte from a weak electrolyte. Remember we said for a compound to conduct electricity, it has to do so when the ions are free to move about. So when the, all the ions are free to move about, we say it has been fully ionized. And in that way, they will be able to conduct electricity better than ones which undergo partial or incomplete ionization. Because for them, they have only a few ions that are free to move about. Now, that is the difference between strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. So in a strong electrolyte, the compound is completely ionized. So we have full ions which are free to move about in the solution. And they'll be able to conduct electricity better. But in the weak electrolytes, the substance is undergoing partial or incomplete ionization. So only few ions are free to move about. And those few ions are the ones that will be conducting the electricity. So since the ions conducting in the weak electrolyte are few as compared to the ones conducting in strong electrolytes, these strong electrolytes are able to conduct electricity better. 
Examples of strong electrolytes, we can think about strong acids and strong bases. Examples of strong acids, we have HCl, H2SO4, HNO3. Examples of strong bases, we have sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. Then we can also think about salts. Examples of salt, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, etc. These are all examples of strong electrolytes. So the strong electrolytes are either strong acids, strong bases, or salts. They are the ones that are able to ionize completely whenever they are placed in water. The weak electrolytes. The ones that do not ionize completely are weak acids and weak bases. Examples. We can think about uh, hydrofluoric acid. It's a weak acid. We can also think about ethanoic acid. It's a weak acid. Carbonic acid or trioxocarbonate for acid. That one too is a weak acid. We can think about ammonia, aqueous ammonia solution, also known as ammonium hydroxide. That one too is a weak base. And it's an example of a weak electrolyte. So remember, strong electrolytes are strong acids, strong bases, and salts. Then the weak electrolytes are the weak acids and the weak bases. We have something we call non-electrolytes. Uh, these compounds, whether you melt them or you add water to them, they are not able to conduct electricity. Why? Because they exist as molecules, not ions. And remember, for a substance to conduct electricity, it needs to have ions that are free to move about. But since these ones are only molecules, they are not able to conduct electricity. And examples are kerosene, sugar, alcohol, carbon tetrachloride. They are non-electrolytes. We also have another thing we need to know when it comes to electrolysis. Electrode. These are two poles of carbon in the form of graphite or any metal at all. But what is their function? Electric current is going to enter the solution through them and exit the solution through them. Electrons are going to enter the solution through them. Electrons are going to exit the solution through them. That is their job. And as you already know, there are two electrodes so far as chemistry is concerned. We have the cathode and the anode. Now, we heard about the cathode and the anode when we were talking about the galvanic cell. We said red cat and an ox. So we said at the cathode, reduction occurs over there. At the anode, oxidation occurs over there. And we know what oxidation and reduction are in terms of electron transfer. These are what occurs at the cathode and the anode. But we said another thing. When we are talking about the galvanic cell, remember in galvanic cell, we said the cathode is positively charged. And we said the anode is negatively charged. That is what we learned when we're talking about the galvanic or the voltaic cell. But once again, this is electrolysis. Things are changing. Remember, in galvanic cell, we will freely give electrons. But here, we have to be forced to give electrons. That's a difference. The polarity of the electrodes too is going to change over here. But please, do not panic. Did I say panic? We can use that word, huh? Panic. 
panic. So things are changing in electrolysis, but do not panic. Why? Because in electrolysis, the positive anode. Negative is cathode. So we already know from galvanic cell that cathode is positive, anode is negative. But it's going to change over here in electrolysis. And we have been told not to panic. Because the positive anode, negative is cathode. So this cathode is the negative electrode. And the anode becomes the positive electrode in electrolysis. But wh why? Because in the cathode, we are going to attract cations. And for us to attract cations, we know cations are positively charged. So we will need a negative pole to attract the cations. Do you see it? Uh -huh. And at the anode, we are going to attract anions. So to attract anions, we need to be positively charged. So here in electrolysis, things change. But please, do not panic. Don't forget it. Uh -huh. Now, these are the things we need to know so far as electrolysis is concerned. Now, in our next video, we are going to talk about the process of electrolysis. Now, in that video, we'll be talking about electrolytes. You'll be hearing anode. You'll be hearing cathode. Remember, we already know these things. There were some few changes, but we have been made aware of the few changes that we shouldn't what panic. So in that video, you might be seeing the positive pole as the anode and the negative pole as the what cathode. But that is why we are saying do not panic. So see you in the next video, which will talk about the process of electrolysis. Thank you.